You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the program. My name is Chris Spangle. Thank you so much for joining me here on the show. And today we are covering a topic that I'm deeply passionate about, and that is school choice. And my guest today is Elizabeth Grace Matthew, who is a freelance writer and editor based in Philadelphia, Philadelphia, excuse me, and is an American Future, America's Future Foundation Writing Fellowship alumna and a Young Voices contributor. I felt like that was like a Sally by the Seashore. Thank you so much for joining me here on the program, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start by defining school choice. What does school choice mean? You wrote an article, the wealthy have always had school choice, poor people deserve it too. I totally agree. But give us an idea of what exactly school choice means in this case. School choice really is parents having the option to access the education for their children that they feel would best serve those children. So typically school choice is talked about in terms of having vouchers where a state pays is a certain amount for them to enroll their children in private, parochial, or public schools. Or it's talked about in terms of tax credits where people can offer scholarships to students under a certain income level to afford school options that are not necessarily their public schools or it's talked about in terms of education savings plans. So there's a lot of specific ways to consider how to do school choice, but essentially what it is is really parental choice in education. Right. So I know that there's probably 50 different funding models and then every school district probably has some variation on this stuff, but in general has it, I know a common phrase is the money follows the student. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know here in Indiana, you you basically the way that it works here is there's the common school fund in our Indiana Constitution from 1816, thanks to all those socialists down in New Harmony, Indiana. But basically, we have public education. There has to be a public option. And now, basically, if a student enrolls in a local school, that school gets the money. So stu- so schools in the first two weeks basically go out and round up kids and have vans trying to get kids to enroll in school and then don't care if they come back after that because they need the funding. But that funding doesn't transfer, I don't believe, here in Indiana over to these schools. But a lot of states are moving to the voucher system. Can you talk about some of the pros and cons of the voucher system that we've seen First of all, like, where did this idea come from and uh, how has it been implemented in some states over the last few years? Sure. I think the idea of having the money follow the student, as you say, rather than be routed into the system has been around for quite some time. And in some states, parents are actually given vouchers and payout to send their students to a given private school of their choice rather than having them routed into a public school. Um, that has faced some degree of opposition. Some people don't want to put the money directly into parents' hands. They would rather do it by tax credits or educational savings plans. These are some of the ways that the state retains a greater degree of control to some extent. Uh, Don't trust you with your own money, but you'll have to pay out of pocket until you do your tax returns when we're not going to give it to you because we're going to (laughs) take that. That's so silly to me. Yeah, I... There's so much complexity in terms of how people want to facilitate it. To me, the biggest and most important point is that students really should not be stuck in failing schools. And as of right now, the only students who are stuck in failing schools are the ones with the least resources and the highest needs. So to me, however we facilitate those students having the opportunity for the educational choice that the rest of us already have. I'm for it. Yeah, absolutely. So I know in some cases in these where the money follows the student, you can use it for anything, right? You can use it for, I think you said in the article, your kids go to, is it a private Catholic school? My kids go to parochial school in Philadelphia. Yes. Okay. Or you could use it for homeschooling, right? 
yeah, for supports, for homeschooling, for co-ops, for homeschooling. And I do think that's where a lot of the opposition gets a little bit trickier, right? To navigate how you want to do that. I mean, homeschooling families even now face certain regulations depending on the state in terms of how they use their money and how they, even if they're not in a school choice state, right? how they register their students or don't register their students. So those are all things where there's a whole lot of red tape, right, that has to be dealt with. However, it's definitely the case that I think we're moving in that direction as a nation, because I think COVID really gave a lot of people insight into how little control parents have, even on some of the most basic questions of school, like whether their student school was open. Yeah, I posted... I don't know how, Elizabeth, this was a controversial statement, but that the parent was ultimately in charge of the child's education. Hundreds of people said, no, it is the school that it should be in charge of education, not the parent. Uh, I feel like the pandemic kind of shifted that, but it also entrenched the other side a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about the attitudes towards education from parents from all the varied interests that COVID had on the subject? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, a lot of parents during COVID would have made very different decisions than their school districts were making about when to be open, about when to mask and not mask, about all those sorts of things. And obviously there's also differences among and between parents, but I think that a lot of people really wished that they could have had a much greater degree of autonomy in terms of what the school would do and districts are big and they're bureaucratic and so it was definitely difficult for individuals to be heard and i think that this idea of parents ultimately controlling their children's education is extremely popular among normal citizens I think the people where there's a lot of controversy are people who are entrenched in this as a, a policy debate, who hear that and maybe think some things that people don't necessarily mean, right? There's movements of unschooling, there's movements of things that you know, maybe would raise some reasonable objections. However, I think in general, most people, when they hear parents in charge of their children's education, they understand it to mean sending their students to a place that they feel will reflect their their aspirations for their children. And they also understand it to mean that the state has an obligation to provide access to education, not to determine what that education looks like. I giggled a little bit when you said normal people because policy experts are not n n normal usually. But I was really surprised in the first paragraph of your article in the Philadelphia Gazette as to how Pittsburgh. popular, how Pittsburgh Post Gazette, excuse yeah. me. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's confusing. Uh, Two P's. I'm from Philadelphia. I know. It's. Uh, a lot of P's. It's so bipartisan. I would have thought, oh, this is just a right leaning issue because of Milton Friedman and all that jazz. But. School choice is very popular amongst Democrats and Republicans by overwhelming numbers. Yes, it's incredibly popular. Well over two thirds of Democrats support school choice and well over 80 percent of Republicans. So it's definitely a bipartisan issue. Our governor in Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, ran on a platform of school choice as a Democrat, and that was extremely popular. Yeah. OK, so. Who's against it then? If it's popular with the people and it's popular with even Democratic governors, who's against it? Two thirds of Democrats being for it leave, leaves a third, right? So you do have some of, as I think in many policy conversations, some of the most extreme people are the people whose voices you hear a lot, right? And who have a lot of influence. And I think that's true on both sides of a lot of debates. And it's certainly the case in this one. So you will have people that find the idea of parents electing their own children's education. One of the arguments that they'll often make is that it will weaken public schools. And you do have people that are very invested in public schools that state that public schools are for the whole community. 
et cetera. And while that's a valid perspective, the counter I would make is that everyone already chooses their children's schools. It's, and most of the people making those arguments don't choose the schools to which they're consigning students with the lowest resources and the highest needs. So given that that's already the case, it is now inevitable that we, it's really a, an equality issue and a, a equality of opportunity issue to give people the same access that most of us already have. Yeah, let's talk about that because I haven't thought about that from a meta perspective. Everybody already has school choice, has access to maybe charter schools or private schools or homeschooling or other options. But often it's the people who are most economically disadvantaged that are stuck in these schools and they'd like a different opportunity too. So how can we expand that opportunity into the children of who have parents of the economically disadvantaged? Yeah, I think that's exactly where school choice comes in, right? When we're talking about school choice, we're really just talking about giving low income parents the same rights that all other parents already have, right? We're talking about parents that don't have the economic resources that I do being able to send their children to the same parochial school that I send mine to or other private or parochial or charter schools or many of us that have resources we vote with our feet we go live places where we do like the public schools but they those that want to get out of some of the schools that have been suffering disinvestment and misinvestment both for generations right some of the people that want to get out of those schools, they don't have the ability to move to a place where they would be satisfied with the public schools because to rent or buy in such a place is often prohibitively expensive. So is the answer changing laws, opening it up from a public perspective? And are the teachers unions right that we're just going to cannibalize those public schools and leave kids with a worse education? Like the, I address the fear. I think that it seems like a valid concern to me. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the solution right, is to get money directly into the hands of parents to have, as you said, the money follow the student rather than be funneled into the system. And I do think that there will be certain schools that will suffer a loss of students because of that. But those are schools where already students outcomes are not what people wish they were, and that's why parents want to get out. So the further weakening of, for example, two thirds of the nation's fourth graders cannot read on grade level, right? And you have schools where the number's closer to 0%. Removing students from that those schools is a good thing. And the extent to which everyone has the opportunity to move out of such spaces will enable some degree of competition in terms of where they go because everyone is at that point armed with the ability to go somewhere that they want to be right with either a tax credit or a savings plan or a voucher economic competition what an idea <laughs> yeah if you're putting out a bad product then you don't deserve my service so what else am I missing? What should I ask you about school choice that maybe is not addressed in your article that is on your mind right now that as we're looking to 2023, you're kind of excited about? Yeah, I'm really excited about the aftermath of the pandemic, as terrible as the pandemic was and as poorly as a lot of public school districts performed during the pandemic, which was devastating for tons of students and cannot be it can't be that we say there's a silver lining because there's not. However, the aftermath of people recognizing the extent to which their lives are conscribed, being in certain public school districts, not having the opportunity to be in schools that they wish they could access. I think it's very exciting that a lot of people are now aware of how this issue has unfolded and also how popular it is for parents to want to send their children to a school that is not their local public school. And so I think that's a really good thing that people know it's bipartisan. There are not a ton of issues that have that level of bipartisan support right now. 
And this is one that does and one that can make strange alliances and cross party alliances, which I think is a really healthy thing, not just for education, which it certainly is, but also just for our civic culture, that there's some areas where we can agree and find common ground to to access something better for all of our kids. So in a parochial school, I know Phil, I know a little bit about Philadelphia and COVID and all that because of our friend Brian Nichols, who fled to literally nowhere, Indiana. Elizabeth Parks and Rec is based on this area of Indiana. I'm not even kidding. Because it was just so rough there. So when you were sending your kids to a parochial school, did you have more control over what was happening with your kids because they have a financial, basically they need to keep your business. Did you find that you had more control than maybe some of the public schools or what was the difference that you experienced as a parochial parent that maybe a public school parent didn't have? Yeah, that's a great question. So the parochial schools in Philadelphia are governed by a central archdiocese. There are also private Catholic academies as well as private non-sectarian schools that truly can do their own thing. So it wasn't autonomous to the extent that, that kind of school might have been. Like there, there were a group of schools, there's an archbishop, there's a secretary of education, there's all these folks in, in kind of what the equivalent of a, a district that have to make decisions. But the decisions that they made were ones that mostly kept schools open and that mostly kept test scores up. And so we've seen increases in enrollment for several years running now in our chassis in schools in Philadelphia for that reason, because the test scores and the enroll and excuse me, and the continued opening of the doors were extremely attractive to people that otherwise would have been consigned to remote school. And so that was a huge plus for the archdiocese and certainly was reflective of the fact that they knew that's what parents wanted. All right. Shameless self-promotion time, Elizabeth Grace Matthew. Where can we follow your work and learn more about what you do? Thank you so much. I'm on Twitter at Elizabeth G. Matt, and I have a website where all of my other social media is listed that is linked to my Twitter. You just have such a lovely name too, Elizabeth Grace Matthew. It just, I really like that name. I appreciate that. My parents, I will let my parents know. Yeah. And our condolences for your loss of the Eagles. So. It was a bad loss. It was a bad loss. Yep. All right. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. All right. And thank you listener for joining me here on the Chris Spangle show. If you learned something, if you got something out of this, please share this with your friends. That's the best way that you can support content creators like Elizabeth and myself. And make sure to join our Patreon. That also helps us as well. Thank you so much for joining us here on The Chris Spangle Show.